Talk to you later. Okay, so here we are, morning session, 8.30. Um, welcome, hello everybody. Let me take a moment to, um, let me see who is here. We have a new face in the group. Her name is Reiko. Would you like to, not to put the pressure on you right away, but would you like <laughs> to introduce yourself? Hey everyone, I'm Reiko Handley, uh, new to Keller Williams. I've been in real estate about 19 years, but I'm so happy to be here into the group and working with Bill so he can coach me and get me on the right track. Even after 19 years, I still need it. <laughs> there you go. We were just talking about that. Is sometimes we got to get back to the basics and uh, um, yeah. do the basics over and over and follow the model. And, and uh, when they say, hey, you've reached this level, do this, do it, right? Um, okay, so you guys are here today to learn a little bit about offers. Is that correct? Making offers? Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay, so let's do um, just one quick uh, uh, thing before we move into that. So don't forget that today is uh, the day that is that we call Bold 100, okay? So after our session is done this morning, I'm gonna stop the recorder and um, I'm gonna mute myself and I'm gonna encourage you guys to use this as a, uh, as a kind of a community room today and uh, allow each other to um, push and support each other as we make an attempt to speak to 100 people about real estate today. Okay, two-way conversations. They could be in person, they could be over Zoom, they could be a text, a social media, as long as it's two ways, it counts. So um, I want you to keep track of all the contacts you make. Um, you don't have to stay in the room if you don't want to, but when I come back from the leadership meeting, I really don't wanna see an empty room. So just keep me happy and uh, do your work today um, inside the room if you can, okay? For those that have uh, coaching sessions with me today, we will do them over the telephone, okay? Now, I wanna push everyone to have one goal in mind, okay? I mean, a lot of goals. We wanna hit 100, we wanna add people to the database, et cetera but let's see if we can set an appointment today, okay? I want that to be what's on your mind, okay? If somebody has questions about the real estate process or wants to know more about what selling would look like or how much their home is worth, set an appointment to discuss that. Today's goal is to set an appointment, okay? Another goal of today is just do more than you're used to doing. I want you to prove to yourself that you can make more calls or take or add more people to your database today is about pushing yourself to go out on a limb and do a little bit more than you're used to doing. Fair enough? Okay. Yeah. Um, I also forgot last, yesterday to talk about, I said I was going to be philosophical for a second and then I forgot to be philosophical. So I just want to share one idea with you. Um, this is a little off subject, but one, one thing that happened to me this weekend is uh, a, a friend of mine, um, a friend of mine from college, her, uh, her father passed away. And um, I was writing on her Facebook and I said, you know, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, for your loss, I'm thinking of you. Okay, that's kind of a common, common comment, right? And then I was thinking to myself, well, what does that actually even mean? When she reads that and she says, so Bill's thinking of me. I wonder what he's thinking about, right? And if you combine that with this book that we're reading called, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Atomic Habits um, that Corey's, uh, Corey Howard's um, book club is talking about. We talk about the fact that our habits essentially make up, right? Whatever we do on a, on a, in a routine way is what, is what we are, right? So when somebody says they're thinking of you, what are they actually, what do you think they're thinking of, right? What is your reputation? What are you known for? Maybe a better question would be, what do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for the person that bails on commitments? Do you want to be the person that goes out of their way to be kind? Do you want to be the person that's known as a, as a um, person that contributes in society or that makes a lot of money or that has flashy car or that goes on great vacations? Do you want to be known as a helper? Right, so we have the, the opportunity as a business owner to number one, create all of our habits and number two, create the, um, the person that people are going to remember. 
question is, what are they going to remember you for? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, we alluded to this a little bit in the um, in the morning session, which was this idea of the big why, right? As we're growing our business and we're taking it to the next level and we're taking on more responsibilities and maybe we agree to hire somebody and, and now we're in charge of their, not in charge, but we have a responsibility for their livelihood, right? Um, but from a financial standpoint, like why are we willing to put ourselves under that stress? Like we're willing to put ourselves under that stress because our big why is compelling us to make more of an impact, right? So as we're starting to set our goals for 2021, well, we've all set our goals. This is too late to set, well, it's not too late to set our goals, but our goals started to be set in October, right? Um, I want you to think about like, why are you doing this, right? When you have a tough day, what's gonna, what are you gonna have to think about or read or see or hear to push yourself through? Does that make sense? Yes. All right, any thoughts, questions on that? All right, all right, let's talk about offers for a second. Um, real, I mean, we could talk about offers for hours and hours and hours. So one thing that I wanna um, kind of use as a, as a overall theme here is the, how you position your offer to be a winner, okay? Now, yeah, we can, we can, I can teach you about, you know, what form goes where, um, uh, and I can also, uh, you know, make sure you know how to find it and how to fill it all out. But conceptually, I want you to understand how can you position your offer to be a winner more often than not. Okay. So speaking about reputation, we all have reputations in the marketplace, right? Or we're about to form reputations in the marketplace. So are you the kind of agent that's known as somebody who answers the phone quickly or gets back or is polite or is really helpful or is willing to do more than their job? Right. I mean, as in, in my business, I would venture to say that I probably do easily a hundred, not this business back in sales, but um, easily do a hundred percent of my job and probably do 75% of the other agents job too. Right. And I'm comfortable with it because if I do it, I know it's going to get done right. Okay, so are you the are you the real helpful person, or are you the person that's always, you know, frustrated and yelling and complaining about stuff, right? So how many times have we as agents come across another agent? And you're like, gosh, that guy was mean, or gosh, that woman never calls me back, or something like that. We want to make sure that everything that comes out of your mouth and every action you take is putting yourself in a good light, so that people want to do business with you. Okay. I've said many times in here, I've got a long list of agents that I could call up right now and say, hey, I got a buyer for your listing. And they're like, oh my gosh, just give me 375 and I can't wait to see you at the closing table, right? It becomes a lot easier because I've got good relationships and I've got a good reputation. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about logistically, how do we do that? Or technically, how do we do that? Number one is we... I, I know that our society is going in the direction now of, you know, oh, just, just showing time it or just text me and these kind of things, right? Um, I want you to follow their instructions, but I also don't see a whole lot of problem with sending them a little, um, an email describing how well qualified your buyer is or the buyer, the, the lender's openness to, um, uh, to speaking to the, to the seller's agent, right? The listing agent. I also don't see a problem with calling the agent and saying, Hey, um, I suspect you're probably going to have a lot of offers or, Hey, you just told me you got multiple offers. What's most important to your client? Is it closing costs? Is it closing date? Is it their closing attorney? Do they want to keep the flat screen TV? Like what, what do I need to know? And what do I need to coach my buyer to do in order to stand out from all of the other people that you guys are considering, right? Because if you just happen to be offer 17 and you haven't made any effort to have a personal contact with that other agent, unless your offer is way better, they're probably not gonna choose you, right? So how can you separate yourself from the rest of the offers? Does anyone have thoughts on that? Has everyone had experience with that or see how that could be helpful? Uh, 
I have. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I, I just wanted to say really quick, when I was looking with my buyer and really, really realized the aggressive nature of the seller's market, or put, I mean, I was kind of regular. Putting them in, no. Putting them in, no. <laughs> and I believe in working smarter, not harder. So, but from the time that I requested the showing, like you said, I do showing time, I would call and I mean, I would try my best to build that rapport at that moment during um, just requesting the showing and get as personal and, you know, build that rapport. And it worked on two different occasions. I had an investor that was back and forth. She, just a minute, baby. We ended up not getting the property, but she negotiated back and forth, like was trying to get me that offer because she just, she was like, I just really like, like you. And she said, I just really like your energy. So let's try and get this done. Exactly. So that, um, that is very, very real. And another quick question, as far as asking what's important to the agent, I'm sorry, to the seller. I yeah. actually had a, um, a realtor tell me he can't tell, he said, you know, I can't tell you that. Um, I don't agree with that. I mean, he was, there's nothing wrong with telling a client what's important or a prospect what's important to your client. He might've heard that as, hey, what do I need to put in there so I win? which right. I'm not afraid to ask either. If he wants to tell me, he can't tell me that, and that's fine. Um, but if I ask, hey, what will it take to win to 100 agents? 99 of them are going to tell me what it's going to take. And for the one that is having a bad day, he can just continue to have a bad day. Okay. Um, uh, but I, I, look, if it's in your client's best interest to share that information, then you should share it. If I tell a buyer, hey, my seller is particularly in, in, uh, in uh, one thing that's really important to them is that they close in the month of March. Why, why is that a dis why am I putting my seller at a disadvantage by sharing that? Right? Um, yeah, I, I didn't understand that one, but you know. Yeah, I, I think that guy probably either misunderstood you or misheard you. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Rico, were you about to say something? Well, Yes, I just wanted to say it is very important when you know you're about to show a property to contact that agent to let them know your buyer's intention, as well as to get good feedback on how to position the offer itself. What that does for the seller is just makes yours more tractable. They feel like you under, you're, you're not going to be a problem. It'll be easier transition from moving yeah. from their home to the next. So I always do that, especially, and it doesn't bother me if they say they have other offers on the table. As long as I do my due diligence to make sure I'm um, showing them that I'm looking out for them right. as well as for my buyer. And also it's suggesting maybe they call my lender to see um, how, you know, how, you know, how strong my buyer's right. loan is. I seem they, to win. Or they like asking them to call the lender is kind of like passing out your business card and expecting it to happen. Right. So you might say like, would you be willing to accept a call from the lender and then have your lender be assertive? Yes, my so lender is always saying, ready. Here's my card. I hope to God that if in the next 20 years you decide you have a question about real estate, you can still locate my card. That is highly unlikely going to be profitable. But if you right. say, hey, let me make sure that I have your contact information, then they're never going to stop hearing from me. Well, what I mean by that, Bill, is I ask them to call in reference to the, the offer that I'm about to write for that particular property. That way they know that not only have they been assured by me that our offer is going to be strong, and most agents just want to know that you're going to be able to get to that table and yeah. we'll, we'll close it. So when I tell them to contact my client's lender, my lender is already ready to help me make sure we get that deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a great idea. I was only suggesting like, making sure that you'll have a better shot of that conversation happening if it's yes. initiated by the lender. Yes, than, absolutely. Because you know, they already have multiple offers. Like this person, this other agent may run out of time. Right, like, right. She might just say, oh, well, let's just take this one. Right, yes, be done with exactly. it. Exactly. Right. right. Um, that also goes for um, writing like a, a, like a cover letter for your offer, right? Hey, this is somebody who, you know, they're, they grew up in this neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. They love the open floor plan. They love the back deck. You know, they can envision their children in the, in the you know, children's rooms and these kind of things like to, to bring out some emotional uh, touches as well. Um, should we talk for a second about kind of the, 
like what makes up an offer, how to put it together? Would that be helpful for you guys? Well, I wanted to add a couple more things that would yeah, please. That, that help make the, you know, help you in getting your offer. I'll one make you is, a, I'll make you a co-host, Pam. <laughs> um, one is to, you know, I, I I make sure the offer is completely filled out, meaning, you know, I fill out all the uh, buy the seller selling agents information. Um, you know, I want to make it as easy as possible for them to reply to the offer. I, so, I, Pam, Pam, let me make sure that people understand what you're saying real fast. So that's okay. like in the um, the signature page of the offer, like where it says the other agent and like their broker and their broker's fax number and broker cell phone number and what their license number is and and what their uh, board of its board of associate or board. Well, that the board uh, of real is. board of association. I don't always know. That's not as easy to find out, I guess. But we well, could just text them and say, "Hey, are you the Atlanta board or are you something else?" I want to make it super easy for you guys to sign this contract. Yeah, so, true. I was just kind of piggybacking on Pam's ideas. Let's make it simple, right? So if there's parts of the contract, hey, just wanted to double check. Are you representing the seller as a client? Just wanted to triple check. So I checked the right box on the on the contract. Hey, it says on the internet, that this is your fax number. Is that accurate, right? Hey, I just check in to see if you're, uh, which board you're part of. So you don't have to mess with that. I'll do it for you. Make it super simple. That's how I roll. So, so all and, of that information is available on the um, FMLS listing, except for the Board of Realtors. That's correct. Correct. Yes. Right, Pam, keep, keep going. Sorry yeah. And the other thing I do is I do a um, like a synopsis of, of the offer. Yeah, I was just about to go there. Go ahead. In the email that I send to them and, you know, specify whether or not my client has another home to sell before they can purchase it, what our purchase price offer is you know, all the, just all the pertinent details of the offer so they can quickly read it and review it. Um, you know, because, you know, so agents are busy and right. the easy and just, the, and the, it just shows them you're being thorough. You're going to be good to work with, easy to work with. You're going to get the job done. Right. And you're, you're highlighting where you could and likely will stand out from the crowd. So for example, hey, instead of doing a 10-day due diligence, we elected to do an eight-day due diligence, right? Rather than asking for a home warranty, we left that out, right? Um, you know, rather than, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what another, what another applicable. Um, well, and if- like, Hey, we, we, we chose to have your broker hold the earnest money. I mean, any of that kind of thing, or they were giving, you know, five grand of earnest money on a $300,000 house. Anything that stands out as slightly unusual could work in your benefit, likely will. Yeah, and also um, the, oh shoot, I lost my train of thought there. Um, I forgot it, sorry. <laughs> okay, anyone else want to add anything to, to that? Okay. Uh, Corey, it looks like you're about to say something. Uh, yeah, good morning. Um, I was just going to say, I think the overall um, the goal is to just make it easier for them. So you want to do whatever it is to, um, you know, like you said, if, if the agent is you have the lender call them like that, you take that extra step or, um, you know, you, you fill out everything you can so that they don't have to. Do it. So it's just, it's, it's not being a lazy agent. Don't be lazy, yeah. you know? So do, you know, make everything as easily as easy as possible um, to grease the wheels to get this thing done. Yeah, the hundred percent. That is the bottom line: is make it easy for the other side. Uh, not only from a like, hey, I'm willing to do some of the stuff that's got to get done, but from an emotional standpoint, to say, hey, I'm I'm here to be a, your partner. I'm your co-op, your cooperating agent. What, what would you like me to do to make this uh, simpler and easier for your side, right? Hey Bill, yeah. can I chime in real quick? Yeah, please. Uh, you know, I'm I'm brand new. You know, anybody doesn't know, I've never written an offer, but um, it sounds like what you're saying is, along with the offer, should I write like a personal email to that agent and go, hey, what can we do to get this done? Because as you you stated before, that a lot of agents just aren't that good. Maybe they're new to it or nervous about it. But if I wrote a personal email saying, let's work together to get this deal done, my buyer's very motivated. Will that help me a long way? Like, what do you need on my end to help this move along that you're 
sellers might be comfortable, more comfortable with? I mean, is that a personal? So thing? I, I would I would tweak it s slightly in terms of the like I would number one I would have that conversation with them before I sent the offer, because if they tell me hey I need a thirty day closing or hey this person actually needs a seventy day closing and is really sensitive about closing with such and such because their uncle works there, right? Then I can incorporate that into the contract as long as my buyer feels comfortable with that. So um, I wouldn't say all that stuff in the email that I'm sharing the offer with. And I also wouldn't communicate that request by email. I would do it by phone so I can hear their voice. Then I'm gonna take whatever they share with me. Then I'm gonna chat with my buyer about why that, why that may or may not be something we elect to do and uh, why it might be in their best interest to do. And then I will present the offer. Now, when I'm presenting the offer, I would go back and do it kind of Pam suggested, which is, hey, here are the high points of the offer, right? We've got a 30-day close. I'm working with a super cooperative lender I've worked with for years. They've already got a pre-approval. Um, they do not have a house to sell. Um, they are working on a, you know, 10% conventional loan. Um, we've already turned in all the paperwork to the lender, right? We, we didn't litter the contract with everything that's ever gone wrong for me in a transaction. There's no request for a home warranty. It's going to be nice and simple, just like you requested. Okay. Right. So you, does that make sense? Is a little, you're, you're on the right track, just tweaking it a little bit. Okay. Thank yeah. You. And if I'm not able to get in touch with the listing agent because you know sometimes they get their you know 25 offers for a property and they have a hard time talking to everyone or getting back to everyone prior to the uh offer due date due date and time i you know i might put in there like you know closing date x and then i, I might say you know um buyer is flexible on closing date, just, you know, in that synopsis of the offer. Right. Like I might put like, Hey, we can close on March 10th, but then I could say in the email, Hey, we're not married to March 10th. If you want to meet, if that's something that's relevant, you know, something that's, uh, you know, particularly meaningful to you, just tell us what you need. And in this day where like, I mean, I've literally heard stories of like 50, 60 offers on a piece of property. Like you got to do some crazy stuff sometimes. Like I, I wouldn't even be above like dropping off some cookies at their office if need be right? Or send them a video text and saying, hey, I'm Bill. I'll probably be offered 45. I just wanted you to know who I am and I'm really looking forward to working together. If there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know, right? I mean, we have to stand out from the crowd. You, you have to sell yourself to that, that agent first. Yeah, yeah. That's All right, important. let's talk for just a second about the, the actual, the, the contents of the offer. I know we're I know we're not going to be able to teach everything you need to know about offers in the next five minutes. However, um, this should give you a, 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 a relative start. Okay, when you're submitting an offer for a buyer, oh, one more thing before we go there. Um, I think a few of you guys alluded to this: is don't be a lazy agent. Okay, everything that you send to another party is going to be a tool in which you're is used to evaluate you and your client. So, for example. I know that it's the seller's responsibility to fill out the seller's property disclosure statement. It is your responsibility as their agent to make sure it reads the way it should read, okay? So for example, if you know they're including the landscaping lights or the switch plate covers or the ceiling fans and they forgot to check it, ask them to check it, okay? Because if the buyer sees that and says, well, you know, I really want the landscape lighting, but they said it's not included in here. And then they get, then it can get, awkward or strange in terms of counters and is it executed? Is it not executed? Do we have to now sign send it over to the other side to have it that initialed or something? Just make it clean. If somebody says, hey, basement flood, it doesn't flood anymore. Yes, I know that's their words and that's probably accurate, but it's not very reassuring, right? A better way of saying that would be, hey, basement flooded. Um, insurance was called immediately. All vendors were licensed and insured. Um, everything was inspected, pictures are available, receipts are available, no problem sense. Which do you think is more comforting for a buyer, right? You're not misleading anyone. In fact, you're telling them more. Does that make sense? You're also saving time too, because if they have yeah. questions, you're avoiding pain, headache, time, energy, all that stuff if you do it on the front end. Yeah, and you're getting somebody that says, hey, the basement leaked, it was fixed. 
somebody's like, uh, I think I'll pass. Right. How do you, how do you ask, um, if I'm the buyer's agent and there's not a good explanation, how do I politely ask for further details or do I, because uh, that's from a listing, obviously that you would be that detailed. That, that's correct. Cause you're the listing agent. You're helping this. I shouldn't say helping the seller, but you are, um, partners with the seller as they fill it out, right? Um, how would you ask for additional information? Um, hey, I would do it in writing, but I would say, I might reference it on a phone call, but say, hey, I wrote you an email that just asked for, is your client willing to share anything else about that basement leak? Right? Okay. And okay. They're, they're, they can decide if they want to or not, but I don't have a problem asking. Say, hey, what, what else can you share? Was it was there insurance involved? Did, did they have a mold test? Like how long ago was it? Did they have to fix the floor? Did they replace the carpet pad? Like what else can you tell me? Right. Um, there's nothing wrong with asking questions like that. G generally speaking, a lot of us seem, seem to be a little hesitant to, to, to ask questions. Don't be hesitant to ask questions. Just ask for what you want. Okay. If you ask for what you want, you'll get what you want most of the time. Okay. Now, well, uh, can I can I mention one thing? Um, yeah. We have a vendor partner with I think he's a vendor partner with State Farm, and he'll provide like a five year loss report too if you wanted to see if there was any uh, there were any insurance claims, um, on a particular property. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, okay. So the offer. This is super simplified. I've got a lot more videos on in in our. Um, YouTube page that goes into a, a significant more amount of detail on this, but your offer is basically composed of the pre-approval letter, okay, the purchase and sale agreement, whatever type of financing doc it is, so that would generally be either the FHA loan exhibit, the conventional loan exhibit, the VA loan exhibit, the USDA loan exhibit, or the all cash exhibit, okay, so pre-approval, uh, purchase and sale, how is it going to be financed, whatever financing document it is, okay, and then the disclosure statements. Generally, the disclosure statements are the seller's property disclosure statement. If the home is in an HOA or in a community with an HOA and rules and reg regulations and whatnot, um, there is a document called the community association disclosure, okay. If the home was built prior to 1978, you have a lead-based paint disclosure as well, okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. That's in the offer? Um, the disclosure statements? Yeah. Well, generally, the disclosure statements are shared with the buyer prior to writing the offer, yet they don't have the buyer's signature on them. The, acknowledge, uh, the acknowledgement of it needs to right. be. Right. Okay. So the, when okay. you're sending in the okay. offer, you would, um, you would have the client acknowledge slash sign the disclosure statements which is not the buyer saying, yes, I believe all this stuff. It's basically saying, I, I've seen it. I've seen it. I acknowledge receipt of it. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, Donna, can you post the State Farm contact information in the WhatsApp chat for me, please, when you get a second? Yep, I sure can. Okay. And um, so that that is the offer, okay? And if it's not accepted verbatim, then you'll have a document called the notice of um, uh, no, what is exact the phrase? It's like notice of re rejecting the offer slash counter offer. I think is what. It's no, called. it's just called counter offer to unaccepted original offer. Yeah, they they've changed that title every year. I think counter offer in the counter offer you're basically writing anything that is not exactly as written in the contract that you want it to read. So if the contract said April first is the closing date. And you guys are fine with that on the counter offer where it says closing date, leave it blank. Okay. But if you want to close on March 27th, you need to put March 27th there. Okay. So again, pre-approval letter, purchase and sale, whatever the financing document is, including cash. Okay. And then the disclosure statements. Am I missing anything? Okay. I just want to make one point about the counter offer. Um, if you have several and go back and forth with counter offers, you a, an agreement only has one legal counter offer. So it's like once you make another counter offer, the first counter offer is like it did not exist. 
So if you have things that you want to carry forward on subsequent counter offers, you need to make sure to put them on there each time. That's a, that is a great point. At the end, right before that final counter offer is going to be signed, what is on that counter offer should be only the things that are different from the original offer. Okay. And by the way, you do not sign the original counter or the original offer because that's not what was agreed to. Okay. You only sign the final counter offer. Um, there was just one question earlier about the difference between due diligence and right to inspect. Good question. Um, in the purchase contract or in the purchase deal contract, there's a uh, language that generally speaking, it's due diligence period. Okay. Due diligence period is essentially a three look period. Um, I've seen that as low as like three or five days or so. And historically it's averaged around 10 or so days, seven to 10 days. That's the buyer's opportunity to do any inspections and um, bring out vendors or engineers or whoever, whatever further testing you want to do, whether it's a radon test, termite test, uh, home inspector, any of that kind of stuff. Okay, during the due diligence period. If for any reason the buyer wants to leave the deal during that time period, they are free to do so without penalty. It could be because they found a different house. It could be because they changed their mind. It could be because the sun came up. It makes no difference. And they're not entitled or they're not required to share any reasoning. They just unilaterally terminate it, okay, using the due diligence period. Okay, right to inspect. I, I'm not the, I don't know that I see a ton of benefit personally, and I, I'm sure I could probably get somebody to, to argue with me on this, but right to inspect is basically saying like, it's got to be material issues. So now you can't change your mind because the sun came up or because your wife found a different home or because you found a different home. It's got to be because there's a, there's a, a material issue with the home. Now, material issue, in my opinion, is pretty gray, right? It could be hey, the um, fuse is the wrong size, or there is, um, you know, the, uh, there's a leak in the roof, or there is a uh, HVAC system is not, you know, the temper temperature differential is not in the appropriate range or something like that. So generally speaking, an inspector is going to find something that could be used to get out of the deal, even if you're right to inspect. Um, but what it would take away is the, uh, the um, ability for the buyer to leave for any reason. That may That is used oftentimes in multiple offer situations to separate yourself from the next guy. Is that a, Pam, do you think I explained that properly? Yes, yes. I mean, it's actually called right to request repairs. And it's, um, you know, it still protects the buyer. They can request repairs. If the seller doesn't agree to those repairs, you know, they can, term, you know, the buyer can terminate the contract. They're not, you know, they don't have to accept whatever repairs the seller will offer. Yeah, exactly. Um, you still have to come to agreement on those. Cool. Um, Greta, was that you that asked that question? Was did, did that? Yes. Yes. That answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Um, I would generally not do right to inspect or right to request repairs unless you uh, completely understand that it's multiple offers and that your buyer understands that it is not now the traditional due diligence period and they actually have to have an unresolved issue um, with uh, uh, the inspection or an uh, unaccepted issue uh, with the inspection in order to leave the contract. Make sense? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, guys, who's excited for Bold 100? All right, don't get scared. You're not going to get kicked out of the group if you do a Bold 30 or a Bold 12. I just want you to do more than you're used to doing today. Is that fair? Okay. Does everyone have who they're going to talk to? They know where the scripts are. They're confident. They're ready. Okay, let me tell you guys. There's a lot of people out there that need a good realtor. Okay, every time you add some to the database, it's worth $625 a year on average. Okay, I want you to have that in mind today as you're speaking to people. Every single person in the world needs our help. Every one of them, they got to live somewhere. They're either going to rent it and we can help with that or they're going to buy it and we can help with that too. Okay, so come from contribution today. Come from curiosity. 
Ask about people's goals for the new year. Make sure you're pouring into them with value and you're asking them specifically, what, you know, what kind of real estate questions do you have? Or, you know, what are your, do you have any real estate goals for 2021 that I should be aware of? Today's goal is about getting data and putting it into the database. And let's go book ourselves one appointment minimum and let's share our good news as we go through the day. Fair? All right. You guys feel better prepared to write offers? Good. Yes. So this is all about, let's go do it. Definitely. Definitely.